What's up, y'all? My name is Jesse Warden, and today we're going to talk about the basics of RequireJS. I'm a uh, software consultant at WebApp Solution. We're a growing software firm that's seen a lot of increase in web application development, which we traditionally did in Flex or Flash and Java. So I noticed that Require tends to be at the core of just about every app we've built, whether design focused or application focused. And I also noticed that a lot of people who are coming from a JavaScript background don't really understand what is the value of it and why it's been at the forefront of trying to convert a lot of libraries to do it the require way. So I wanted to basically talk about those. Why is it valuable? What does it provide? And show some examples of some ways of using require. Now we're going to cover the basics. We're not going to cover you know any optimizations, any compiling for production, or anything like that. Um, it's just the you know if you're coming from languages such as ActionScript or Java or Python or Ruby or C Sharp or even some platforms in Lua, you're used to having classes, you're used to having pack packages, and you're used to both of those things handling dependency management for you. Additionally, you're also used to the programs or runtimes handling the optimizations of those so you can write as it is but it has a way to actually optimize the code for whatever you're deploying to. So why require? What is it? Well I'm basically taking exactly what they have from the Y web modules and the Y AMD page. It's the same thing. It's all about code organization. You can take a, a big chunk of JavaScript and put it into multiple files. Number two, you can it's for code scalability you can take multiple files and over time organize them instead of having to scroll through a 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 lines of code in JavaScript just to find a single function or a variable you can go to multiple files and most tools nowadays, IDEs and things like that allow you to manage multiple files, navigate through multiple files as well as the, those that have dependencies in the language like JavaScript and everything else Additionally, this works on a team. When you have multiple people, they can all work on different files. Those files can have their changes merged in without affecting another file, things like that. The third is our optimization of code. Optimization of code is very difficult to do in multiple files which reference each other. So all programming languages that have some form of comp compilation target usually have either A, designed the language around that, or found a way to make development abstract that problem away so to speak. Required has done both. So Require has a library with it called RJS which has some other wrappers like Ugify, blah blah blah, but what it does is you can use all the packages and all the classes and all the files you want and at the end of the day it'll compile it down to a single file that is compressed and minified and uglified and all the white space taken out and really optimized for web and mobile and things like that. So you can have a development mode and actually co compile using require, but we're not going to really talk about that today. We're just talking about the actual functionality that Re require provides because that other stuff, you don't have to think about it, just works usually. <laughs> usually. Number four is multi developer teams, which you already briefly touched on, is that multiple people can work on multiple files, multiple classes, and they have a way to handle all the dependencies between them. Nested dependencies, so if you build a component which depends on another component, you don't have to worry about all the intricacies of loading files over the web and the order of dependencies require takes all that for you. It handles uh, circular references, it handles files that reference other files that need those loaded first before another file can use it, blah blah blah. Ease of use versus compilation, which I briefly touched on as well, it handles all that but you don't have to worry about for the most part the optimization at runtime. So if you're doing multi-page development or you're doing mobile development, there are some options that you can do as well. So it's not just a black and white. There's a lot of configurations that you can do to optimize ahead of them if you'd like. And finally, asynchronous. So the web and multiple files and multiple assets are loaded in an asynchronous manner. Sometimes you're loading all your assets at once. Sometimes you're loading your libraries from third parties. Sometimes you're integrating with files on a development server which have multiple files from multiple locations, multiple servers, CDNs. So you need to be able to handle a module in an asynchronous way. You can't assume that all your code is loaded up and ready to go immediately. Require handles that. So those are the main problems and solutions that Require actually has. It deals with all that stuff. If you're building just normal websites, if you're not building an actual large application, 
if you're dealing with just, you know, little itsy bitsies uh, mobile apps that have, you know, four or five pages, maybe six that, you know, have small functionality, that's fine. You might not need require. I use it for everything just to keep my code organized. It's a workflow that I'm used to coming from more mature programming language background. And just about every language has it except for JavaScript. So the most important thing is that this is the future. These kind of things such as require and defined are going into the ECMAScript 6 specification. Even though strong typing isn't at the forefront, modules are. It's, it's a clear problem in the web community that has built upon open source libraries. And being able to share and leverage that open source work, which has made the web what it is today, is definitely some of the most important problems to solve and making that easier. So that's why what we do with Require and AMD and CommonJS and all the other ways of loading code through modules is where we're going. So what you write today in Require doesn't have to be changed that much in the future. There's going to be a lot of legacy code. And trying to adopt the de facto way of doing things is pretty important. So that's why Require.js is not just some made-up third-party library that's going away. It's, it's basically the future of web application development, and we're at the start, unfortunately, <laughs> which is good and bad. So that's why. So let's talk about what. The only three things you really care about for Require are the f three functions of define, require, and config. So config isn't really a function, but it's more of a, a common convention that you configure how require works. So th there's different projects. The web is very vast. The deployment targets, whether you're doing desktop, mobile, web, TV, whatever, are also very vast. If you're doing multi-page or single application, what kind of language are you using? JavaScript, CoffeeScript, TypeScript, blah, blah, blah. So it those configuration variables, as well as how you build, are very vast, and you can configure it. And you're probably going to conf configure something you know at the basic level there's not a lot of defaults that work for every project so let's show some um, some code for that so define if you're familiar with other languages is a way to define a class or a module now you'll notice that I'm going to use the words define and class as a synonym but they're not a define is merely just a function defined by require so if you look at this I'm using this code the JavaScript unit test runner. It's an example of how to do JavaScript unit testing using Jasmine. And I used require a lot in it to do multiple classes and things like that. So I'm going to use this as an example of using required classes. So the only real script tag you ever have to really require <clears throat> is require itself. You could even um, add other things up here as well, but require is trying to prevent all of this, right? This, this doesn't scale for large projects. It doesn't deal with nested dependencies, blah, blah, blah. So you should usually only have one or two of these. These and some sort of logger, some other third-party libraries that you have to have, such as Omnisure, things like that. Then down below, you can actually define your dependencies, such as, you know, I require these dependencies. So let's look at uh, define. Define basically says this block of code is loaded inside of this file, this device dto.js. Now, if you're not, not familiar with a DTO, a DTO is just a data transfer object. It is an object or JSON object that is transferred to a server. It's not supposed to have functionality such as this. It's really just to be the smallest chunk of data that you can possibly send across the wire. Ruby on Rails and Python traditionally do JSON. Java and .NET sometimes will do XML, but they can do JSON nowadays. So it just depends. But the point is that this is a small chunk of data that I'm going to get and it's defined as a domain object, in this case, a device, a device data transfer object, or device DTL. The device has five properties, a code, a description, serial number, device activated, and if it's active or not, is a Boolean. And it, uh, it, this is just to print it out pretty. So if you call it to string, it actually says what it is versus object object, which is not helpful. So this define says, define this block of code as a module, right? That's all this is. Now this chunk of code as well as this file can be loaded as such you can reference dto and it'll load this in because this define gives it enough information or metadata for required to know okay this is a file i can load it, these are its dependencies this is its name good to go you'll notice i have uh, two parameters an array and a function now there's a lot of other uh, function signatures but these are the only one we care about for now the first is who are my dependencies does device DTO need any other class or chunks of code to work? Right now, no. It works with pure JavaScript. It's good to go. Funky Comedina. The second is a callback that runs once all your dependencies are loaded. 
this will probably run pretty immediately since I have no dependencies and I explicitly say an empty array, right? So this will run pretty quick and call it a day, okay? Same with error. Error as well is another DCO to finds an error that I get from the server, which usually has a code that I can look up as well as a message that the server sometimes will send. Now, error DTO in this case is an error object that I will use to display usually the message to the user. Sometimes I have to do code lookups and things like that. He as well has no. Now, traditionally, this chunk of code and this chunk of code would be put in the same file. Here's the problem. If this file updates, I've updated one file and I'm constantly checking that in the source control. Additionally, if somebody else has it, I have to remind them or tell them to check on their changes before I can merge mine. Versus, this file can be updated independently. That's just this for starters. Let's look at response. Response actually uses an error. Some responses from the server will have errors in them and some will not, right? So this is where define really starts to shine in terms of being a module definition. First, it says this file, response DTO, cannot actually work until I have this chunk of code or this object or this class loaded. In this case, error DTO. Once error DTO is loaded, it's actually passed here. Now, the reason it's done that is it actually gives me the object that is in this file. In this case, de this device DTO. It actually returns this function, which is basically a closure type of class. You could also do the prototype way if you'd like, which is basically the same thing as device DTO equals an object, and then you could say device DTO dot prototype to string equals function, blah, blah, blah. And you could do the exact same thing. And that's you know fine as well. You can do the prototype way if you want. I like closures just because I find them easier, even though the browsers have optimizations for prototype readability is mo most important, especially when you're doing large projects on large teams. Once this class is loaded, this error DTO works. Now the difference is too, this is not stuck on window. Now if you know about anything about JavaScript development, you have this global variable called window. Window is where basically everything is. So if you say global cow, let's see something more familiar to most people, foo, bar, any class in anywhere will have access to this, right? And that's where most classes traditionally are, are defined. They'll do something like if window.foo uh, type of undefined, then it's not defined, so let's define it, right? And then it would define their class in this case, window.foo, and then it would say window.foo, they would say then f at that point they could say foo dot prototype dot method equals function, blah, 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 right? <clears throat> so this is the old school way of doing it. And then you would have multiple one of these in a single file, but you don't have to do that anymore. Require handles all that. Additionally, it doesn't put it on window. So the only way to actually reference a class is to load it and to declare it as a dependency, right? Now, I know some of you Java guys are, or C Sharp guys are freaking out because you're like, where's my dependency injection? I'll get to that in a future video. But for now, this is how you do dependency injection. You actually define your dependency, it brings it in. And the cool thing is, is that require manages to load this first always. It will always load error first before it loads response CTO and instantiates it. So you know you're good to go. If anybody in their mom uses response CTO, they it'll be guaranteed that this will load first, then response CTO file, and then whoever uses it. So let's show an example of that. Let's go to the device factory. The device factory takes JSON and makes this uh, actually basically DTOs out of it. And the reason it does that is there's some simple business rules. Now this is a simple example where it just does a one-to-one -one copy of some properties. But in most applications, you'll have a little bit more things you're gonna decorate on the client. You're gonna store some things. You're gonna do some application and business logic, blah, blah, blah. Additionally, you want, you want to test these things. So if the server sends you JSON but it's null, you want your unit test to catch it. You want your services to be a little more tough to take that, you know, more uh, durable and provide meaningful errors. For, instead of some null pointer at some random place, it tells you why it failed, right? So this factory has a dependency to device TTO. So it has to import that first before this device factory class can actually work. Okay, now you'll notice that most of my normal classes that I want to provide multiple instance of return a function constructor with an object so I can new it, right? So I can say, in this case, let's go back to your factory. I can say new device DTO, right? Once this comes in, I reference this variable. This variable could be anything such as uh, device homes. And the reason is, is that that's an object. It doesn't have any namespace. And this goes back to things aren't put on window. 
So it'll provide them in the order that it comes. So let's show an example of that. If I change that name, that's now, right? Obviously, you want to keep the convention of the class, right? So that's the convention that you do is keep the name the same. You don't have to keep the entire package path or folder path, whichever you want to call it. I call it a package path because I'm from a language that has that, but you can call it whatever. Okay. Notice here, I don't return a function. Device factory is an object. This is basically another way of doing a static class or a singleton. So every time I use this factory, I'm always getting the exact same instance because it's basically a singleton. It has no state. <laughs> right? It's just a factory. It creates stuff. There's no reason to create multiple instances of a factory. I could if I wanted to, but whatever. So point is, require supports that as well. Okay. So let's look at response factory. He has a lot more dependencies, and this is where require gets pretty cool with the uh, dependencies and definitions configurations. So there's underscore. Underscore is not in JS, okay? It's nowhere to be found. <laughs> Yet I'm somehow referencing underscore. This is a alias, and some languages allow you to do this. Instead of typing the entire package path out, such as lib slash underscore slash underscore, which is right here, Instead, I can say underscore, and I'll show you how that's done. Let's go check it out. Go up here. Now, traditionally, you'd load require config as a external file, but I define it in index just to make it easily findable. So config says configure require before you do anything, okay? And this is global. So I say require.config, which basically takes an object as a configuration. The base URL is also basically your base uh, source path, if you're familiar with setting source paths in other languages. In this case, it is the current folder.js. So the index.html is right next to the JS. So I say the JS folder that's right next to you. Optimization is for build time. You, don't, you can completely ignore this. So I'll just delete it because it doesn't matter. And you'll notice I have some aliases. So these, this package allows you to override very common pieces of code you'll basically use in every JavaScript app you do. And these are the following. JSON, everyone and their mom uses JSON too. Right to guarantee that in newer browsers you use the JSON, in older browsers it falls back to the parsing the logic. Right, jQuery. If I'm going to use jQuery everywhere, just type jQuery. <laughs> I don't need to type libs jQuery everywhere. Same with underscore. Same with backbone. Right. Now let's take a look at what's also special about backbone. Or I'm sorry, underscore. Underscore I define as the normal underscore, right? Now traditionally using old school underscore, this would be defined on global and you'd be good to go, right? It'd be on window. You could use it everywhere in your projects and just type underscore. Here I actually have to manually say the first class that comes back is the first time of the function. Instead of calling it underscore, right? I actually do the consistent normal underscore, like the actual underscore character. And that way anybody who wants to use it can, right? The second parameter is the second dependency or second class response DTO, which is here. And what do we remember about response DTO? He has the dependency of error DTO, right? So it's loaded first, response DTO is good to go, then the response factory is good to go and loads this, right? Error DTO is already loaded from the response DTO, so we're good to go, but I pass it in anyway. It's the third parameter, right? So at that point, as far as this is concerned, it can use response DTO, error DTO, and underscore, and not have to reference window, it just assumes they're global, but it's actually global to this class definition scope as I like to call it. Again, this doesn't have to be a class. It could be, you know, just plain JavaScript. A lot of people do that for utility functions, class wrappers, things like that, right? And that's fine. You don't have to define a closure. I just do that because I'm used from an OOP background, okay? So in here, you just define a class. You can use your dependencies as normal and actually get it back, blah, blah, blah. Pretty normal stuff, right? Now here, I should be doing new, but I'm not because I'm a slacker. Um... So that's basically it. Normal JavaScript class-based development using define to define my classes, right? And if, if they use define, then you can pass them in as, a, as a, a dependency. All right, so the root, once everything's good to go, the root of your application uses the require function. So we've shown you define, right? In every single module, we've defined every little class, right? And notice again, just to remind you, the classes line up, or the files or modules, whatever you want to call them, line up with the, fo the folder path. So DTO slash device DTO, or factory slash response factory, right? And that's how you actually define those dependencies. This is relative to the root. You never want to do this crap, okay? We know, you know, because this is relative where the file is defined, and you never want to do this crap, because this hard codes it to the root. You want to do it relative and have a single global configuration of where your classes come from, okay? makes your code portable, makes it easily configurable, and 
saves a lot of headaches down the road. I know it's hard to, you know, want to do this if you're under deadline. I get it. The goal is not to, you know, follow the, the rule of the stone. The, the rule is to try. Try to do it this way. Okay? Just a good practice. It's okay if you break it. We all have deadlines. Understood. So require says, okay, I want to require these classes. And when it's ready, I want to use them, right? Require is very similar to define. But instead of defining a module, require is just use the module, right? So same syntax for the most part. Define the classes or modules or definitions I want to load and then give them to me, right? So in this case, it would be device factory spec, activate device or respect, right? These are the actual unit test files that I want to load, which are also used to define. But for now, I'm just, I'm like, look, once they're loaded, then Jasmine can actually execute them, okay? Inside of this current scope. So that is a, a, an example of using these. So let's show a little bit more deeper folder structure. So I have over here an example of handlebars. Handlebars is a basically a way to define JavaScript templates. If you're not familiar with handlebars, um, I don't have the project open currently, but basically handlebars allows you to load in external handlebar templates. So if you've ever been doing HTML and JavaScript, defining JavaScript inside of JavaScript to then or HTML inside of JavaScript to then write to the page in a dynamic way is a, is a pain once it gets pretty big. So what Handlebars allows you to do is actually define these templates externally as normal HTML. And there's actually a plugin for TextMate, which will highlight them, which I don't have. I could probably install it now. Uh, let's see. Install. Oh, yeah. I'm not on the internet. Well, there we go. It's a new house. Sorry. <laughs> no internet yet. There's not even cables in the underground. Um, but anyway, this is like you can write normal HTML, right? And then using these little brackets, they have all kinds of syntax. But all you care about is if you give it an object, it'll automatically read these and inject these in HTML. It's really, really nice. Okay. So if you want to see an example of that, um, I'll open Safari. I'll open the handlebars example project, which is in here. All right. So as you can see, it's taken that chunk of handlebar template and injected a piece of data that has a first name and a description and rendered it as such, right? What does that mean? That means take this JSON and shove it in this HTML and then shove that a jQuery, right? So this one line of code right here basically prevents me from having to manually write this in JavaScript each time with utility methods and dealing with quotes or single quotes, blah, blah, blah. Now these can get pretty big if you're doing component-based development on a large project with many, many different CSS classes targeting many different devices. These handlebars, templates really basically make your views have a lot less code. <laughs> it's really easy and flexible. You can give these to a designers and let them figure it out while the coders actually write the code. And for things using Angular or not really much Angular, but more like Ember and Backbone, things like that, that actually externalize the actual rendering from the framework. Underscore really just, or Backbone has a template. It expects you to figure out <laughs> how you want to draw it, right? Handlebar is a great way to do that. It's so, It really makes doing view-based development separate. So you can make your view, handle all the actual data and display of that, and your backbone views or your actual JavaScript code can be the controller or presentation model, whatever you want to call it, right? Pretty cool. The complex example is just using require as well, right? So I say HBS. This is one other feature of require, which is kind of neat. You can do paths, and paths are more instead of calling paths are more like a prefix so you can say prefix uh anytime i use a special prefix which is this bang or whatever in front of a package name it'll load that that dependency to that first so basically the handlebars class is going to get this dependency rather than you what does that mean well it basically means before i actually handle the dependency let this other class handle first handlebars expects you to do all this crap. It expects you to load it via a, an external, you know, XHR call or some other load file of text to, to load the HTML. Then it wants you to actually compile it in the handlebars compile mode. And keep in mind, handlebars is built on mustache, right? Which is JSON as HTML. Handlebar says, no, use HTML. HTML is beautiful. But you still have to compile it. And there's a lot of safety concerns, such as, you know, cross um, injecting JavaScript and things like that, right? And UTF 
hacks, all that crap. So you have to compile it to Hannibal's first to actually get the template ready to go. Then you have to take your data and inject it in the template to render out the HTML that you're going to then draw via jQuery, right? All this insanity, <laughs> right? Just to use it. It's like, that's fine for a small project, but that, that's not going to fly on a large multi-man team project, right? So you use the Handlebars plugin, which basically allows you to type just this. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's look. If you go down here, you'll notice I say HBS bang. And I say, all right, load this. What this means is Handlebars, will uh, the plugin for require, will go load this guy, do all that crazy insanity that was up here, right? And then it'll say, all right, now your template's good to go. At that point, all you have to do is run your data through that function. That's it. So it reduces all that insanity to that. Additionally, you can treat your handlebar templates as normal require modules, right? So it's normal coding. And the visual difference is this prefix of HBS. Pretty cool. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Configuring this to work is a nightmare. <laughs> like, the... HBS handlebars, you know, default doesn't work with require. There's, I'm, I'm starting to find this out that most JavaScript developers use like one or two libraries and then hack them to somehow get their dependency order right and then they go on with life. I'm not sure how, you know, the library developers like expect a broader adoption without a good module system and it's not their fault. The web doesn't have it. This is why require was invented. So you have to basically take the old handlebars and wrap it like it, it was. It had this right and defined on window. They then wrap it in a function closure and then do all the require stuff in here somewhere. It's it's insane. Then HBS is like kind of like a shim, which defines normal, you know, define define your dependencies and everything else, and then configures all these guys to work together. And it's just crazy because then a lot of these things are relative. So you actually have to go in the HBS library file and configure it to work in your project. It's like, excuse me, like this is a nightmare. But I would rather use this than do this on 50 billion places. It's just, you know, it's insane, right? So once you get it working and configured, you're good. I think the, the best thing you can do is use the handlebars and pre-compile stuff that he's included, Alex Sexton, inside of his GitHub project. You do that, you're good to go, <laughs> okay? You may take it out hard to configure, but once you do, you're good. You'll understand it, you'll be happy, and move on with life. These are the kind of problems that shouldn't be hard to solve. Even with somebody who's trying to give you a handlebars that works with require, it doesn't work out of the box if you use different versions of libraries and everything else. It's just, you know, not really working together. So you can see how hard it is when somebody else gives you a library that doesn't use require or common JS, right? It's just, it's a nightmare. So this is neat though in that, you know, any other library can do a lot of different things other than load files. Handlebars doesn't just load text files. It actually does some pre-compilation to them, converts them to handle, you know, template files with, you know, data injection. So it's really, really cool. There's a lot of other things such as wire, which does dependency injection this way. There's the text plugin. There's all kinds of really cool plugins for require or libraries that adopt this model. Okay, so this is just one way you can do it, and you can define it in that path place, which is right here. Okay, pull it out. And again, I have all my common packages like jQuery and stuff, so I don't have to type jQuery, you know, libs jQuery everywhere and jQuery. I just type jQuery and call it a day. And it require knows that these are global aliases. Pass are the, the special bang things you see. Uh, wait 10 seconds just to cover that real quick. Y you shouldn't set this low. It's pretty, I think it's like two or something out of the box. On some phones and some, you know, slow servers, it's r completely reasonable that a jQuery file or a JavaScript file or a text file could take a while to load, even if it's teensy. There's always server latency. So you should just set this for development high. Because if it doesn't load, your entire project breaks, you know, you're basically punishing the user with a <laughs> broken app. So you should put this pretty high. I know it's lame sauce, but it is what it is. If you want to test your server, yes, you should actually, you know, definitely set it low. But for development, just, it doesn't, I don't know why the default's not higher. I, I'm, I guess they're trying to, like, say your code's broken, but that's, you know, the real world I've lived in is servers are slow. This is the way it is. So that's the, the template thing I want to shoot with um, handlebars. Let's show... I've got a router example I'm dealing with Backbone, and um, it has something interesting with dependencies. So there's an issue with uh, underscore in Backbone sometimes not being loaded 
so you can actually nest require statements. It's it's a way to ensure dependencies are loaded if you don't have time to actually fix the core library, and that's fine. You basically load underscore first, and then your entire app works because underscore is loaded. Why not just define it up here? You could technically do that, yes, but then you'd still have to define underscore somehow if you're going to use it right in other pieces of your project because underscore is a utility library, right? that has a buku amounts of wonderful functions and utility functions and class inheritance and templating and all kinds of great things. So you still have to use it with <laughs> require, you know what I'm saying? So that's uh, that's that's one thing to be aware of. So if I, I'll, I'll show you this router example real quick. It, all it is is it shows um, deep linking, but it uses backbone, it uses underscore. So the actual backbone framework, as long as that's loaded, I can use the subclasses and call it, you know, extends and everything else, right? So that's good. And here's an example of what happens if you don't use handlebars. <laughs> like defining HTML and JavaScript. What would he do? This is ridiculous. So that's why handlebars is awesome. Or mustache, whatever. To each their own. So that's the basics of uh, require. There's one other one. Um, there's code like CoffeeScript and TypeScript, you know, languages that allow you to use, you know, like a normal programming language. And then it just compiles a JavaScript. So it does all the normal things. And um, there's a bug in TypeScript. So this is actually just to be Persian. So ignore the module of crap. If you're in Python, this should look pretty familiar. But TypeScript is a way to get strong typing inside of JavaScript, and it's optional. The reason that's important is that not only do you get classes and modules and everything else, but you get strong typing. So I can define things such as like, uh, age as an integer and the name as a string, right? These two things will get so many bugs and, you know, prevent so many bugs and help. It's just the compiler really can help you with that kind of stuff if you actually add that metadata type ending. And it's optional. This all compiles to JavaScript. So if you actually look at the JavaScript it generates, it's just JavaScript. But you'll notice you have an option to define an AMD module as it compiles, right? So even TypeScript recognizes that this is the future. It's ECMA, ECMA you know, six, six based, and it's using optionally. If you look at the compiler, you can say module AMD or common JS. So I use AMD, and it'll render out your code there. If you want to try this, you can actually go to TypeScript and play, and it'll actually generate this 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 code out. You could also put your um, code in there with require. And it'll take all this and shove basically define on top, <laughs> right? That's the only thing it does. It's pretty cool. So again, it's all JavaScript, but I just wanted to point out that this module, this third-party module that I'm using is an external module. It maps directly to require.js as a third-party module. So this should look pretty familiar. Notice I'm saying person vo, not person vo.js, right? Where this is a module. So very similar, very, you know, whatever. And again, you can write, you know, require if you write it by hand, it's a lot more readable, but in TypeScript, you get strong typing. So it's just another way that requires being used as a generation tool, not just writing apps in it, but it's actually, again, it's a core library that's at the crux of just about any large app. You need to have some way to define modules, right? So they know in TypeScript, it doesn't scale. In JavaScript, it's very challenging to scale. So they were like, well, okay, but we still have to have a module. How are we going to do it? Well, they're going to use require. Okay. So that is basically it for require. Um, don't know really what else to say other than, you know, you can see all this code on GitHub, uh, the unit test stuff, the handlebars examples up there. Um, I have a blog post on TypeScript for ActionScript developers, which covers all the value of that. And again, everything I've talked about with require is applicable to TypeScript because just like CoffeeScript, you can't really effectively code CoffeeScript and TypeScript unless you know JavaScript, right? So it's very important to know. The... Um, Router example, I'm not publishing it. I'll post that in a future video. But again, uh, it's the same concept of using, you know, those de defining dependencies first before they're gone. So again, what is require.js? It's just a core library to define modules or JavaScript classes or functions and external files and help your code scale and actually grow. If you're working with multiple people, it allows you to actually have multiple people work on multiple files without like a normal programming project. And if you're from a traditional programming language it's basically packages and class definitions done in a normal way right so you can put files and folders and define classes and import modules right and keep everything there it doesn't solve all your scope issues it doesn't solve your optimization issues i'm going to show you building in a future video but that is you know the core value okay again the what is it has the 
two functions that you really care about are define and require. You actually define your modules using the, oh, let's not use TypeScript. Let's use this one. You define your modules via the define function. The first parameter is your dependencies. It's an array of package paths or folder paths, whatever you want to call it. You do not put JS. And the actual files have to match up. So it's DTO slash device DTO, right? And the order in which you define them is the order in which they come in into the function. So these are no longer on window. Now keep in mind, they could be on window. Somebody could be irresponsible, but it is what it is, right? And to actually use them, you use the require function to require the module and then use it. Very similar to define, but you're not defining a module to use. You're just required, OK? And you also can nest them if you have to for crackheads who have weird dependencies <laughs> that have been fixed in different versions. And finally, config allows you to do all kinds of craziness. Let's look at the um, yeah the config here. But there's all kinds of other there's just millions of config variables, which is awesome. Require has a lot. And again, if you go to the require JS site, where is it? Here it is. They will explain all that, give you all the docs for it and everything else. It's uh, requirejs.org. Keep in mind, um, again, if you go to GitHub slash Jester Excel, that's where all my code is for handlebars example, for the backbone router example, which you shouldn't be looking at yet because I'm not done, and the JavaScript Jasmine unit test example, which has all the other ones. So three examples of requirejs. The TypeScript stuff you can find on my blog on the requirejs article where I talk about TypeScript and how you actually use it in the code that they actually generate for the modules, right? So again, I'm Jesse Warden. I work with WebAS Solution. And if you have any questions, you can email me at jesse at jessewarden.com. Or you can hit me up on Twitter, twitter.com says Jester Excel. I'm on Google Plus as well, and Facebook as well. So I hope this helps for Require JS. Thanks.